name is Richard Levine. He's an architect. He teaches at the University of Kentucky. He's been teaching there for a number of years. He uh, is a researcher. He's done some very interesting, innovative thinking in numerous areas of architecture over the last uh, decade. And in that most recent period of time, roughly the last 10 years or so, he's been heavily involved in thinking about some of the scenarios of our energy future as it relates to the architectural design profession. Richard went to school at the Rhode Island School of Design and at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He uh, received the Alpha Rho Chi Award while he was an undergraduate. He received a scholarship to go to uh, Italy to study there for a while. He's written about 35 or 40 papers on energy. He's written a book and uh, has two patents, one on the couple pan space frame, which is a concrete space frame, and the other patent is on a multi-stage active solar collector, which you will see some slides of when he shows you his house. He uh, spent a little bit of time with my studio today. We had a good discussion, and he'll be here through the night. We hope that uh, we'll be able to meet with some of you individually and talk with you at some length. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you a colleague, a friend, and a former teacher, Mr. Richard Levine. Thank you, Bob. It's a great pleasure to be here on Monday after a final party. Can hear Population, 
So all of the problems out there uh, fall to other people. It seems a little strange that this should happen because it's always it's been architecture for many years that has, uh, of all the professions, that it has accepted the most social responsibility, the most uh, responsibility for the, the entire environment, the entire built environment. Uh, but now when we're really at the brink, now that we've mastered uh, in many ways the modern vocabulary, we've, uh, uh, we very much abandoned this role and are looking backwards. The, uh, the sort of, uh, the sort of work that, uh, that that I would like to talk about has to do very much with the future. And the future, uh, I feel, especially in, in terms of architecture, we are, will uh, bring incredible new opportunities. Uh, uh, but it will require a major paradigm shift, a major shift in the way we think about it. He's an architect. Because our, our, whole, uh, our whole cultural background is based on the availability of humanity. It's based on consumption and it's based on direct consumption uh, creating many forms of pollution. Uh, we're all in our society, we're all potentially consumers. And, uh, and this consumerism uh, is based on a curve of any energy consumption that is not enough to be measured with. And we know that there's not too many questions to it. Well, this is, this is a new problem that hasn't existed before. It, in fact, is a, is a problem that technology itself has been. It did not exist before the advent of technology. Uh, our, for decades, we thought that technology was solving all of our problems. And now we're faced with uh, the, the whole uh, litany of problems I started to go through in the beginning are problems that, in fact, technology has created new problems. Uh, in past centuries, in past centuries, the, uh, our Earth was self-sustaining. We lived in Silicon Our Earth was in Silicon Valley, where the only two would have to be Today, that's no longer possible. They're all protected a great network. The, uh, the way that this can come about is, I believe, only through integration. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what I think is a very modest beginning. Uh, in a study for the house that, uh, that I designed about eight years ago. And my wife and I have spent almost eight years building. Uh, it's a solar house in Lexington, Kentucky, Illinois. I get all of the heating and cooling from the sun. Um, and we show them the time. house at night, uh, time exposure, facing north. The, the modern movement, the mainstream of the modern movement through, uh, is, is the stream, is the branch typified by Mies van der Rohe. And this branch uh, was known for its 
simplification for its reduction, for for making the form of architecture ever more simple, for reducing all elements uh, that could not be universalized. So finally, we came up with the universal state, which uh, presumably was could be used for anything, but in fact was was useful for very little. And what is the reaction we see today is the reaction against it, against the central uh, trend of, of modern architecture. I, I feel that the period that we're in now, that has got so much attention, is called post meeting rather than whatever period it can be called. Because it's both the reaction against me, as well as the attention of this sort of reductionism. Uh, the post meeting tend to reduce other forms of content and then add and work from the basic Robesian uh, uh, RT and then add various things to, to decorate it, various forms and various formal tools to uh, decorate the architecture. One of the things that has gone out of the architecture is the connection of the building with site and with orientation. Uh, uh, this shot of a solar building shows a uh, very specific uh, orientation. Only designers, only architects, only people who are involved in integrative pursuits 
are likely to come up with a model for a sustainable future. I'll give you one that I think is a very good example. When I started designing this house, this was um, well, over eight years ago, uh, there were no solar collectors on the market. You couldn't buy them. Uh, and uh, very little was known about their performance. Most collectors that were being proposed were water collectors. This seems to make a good deal of energy. Water is an excellent heat exchange to you. Uh, it also um, has a very high specific heat. Uh, it also can be moved around very simply with small pumps and small pipes. It can be stored very well. Uh, a few people had the high air system, but everyone knew that, uh, that it took a huge duct to move a certain amount of feet at a small height, and the air was a terrible heat uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the air had a very, very slow specific heat. Well, through a design process, I was able to discover that these very negative properties of air could, in fact, be uh, integrated in such a way that inherently it could make a more efficient collector than a water collector. Now, to give you a little background on why I think only designers could have made this discovery, uh, this was a time when a lot of people were working on collecting. The scientists in the laboratory were getting grants to try to come up with the most efficient water collector. And they would start with the assumption that, well, a solar collector is perhaps three feet by six feet in size, four feet by eight feet in size. So that was a given. And then they started working with sometimes very exotic materials, like uh, coatings based on salts of gold or other precious metals. And they came up with very efficient collectors that were often very expensive and often very shoddy. The scientists weren't particularly interested in it industrial product, they were just interested with getting a high level of performance for a short period of time. On the other hand, there were manufacturers who uh, were interested in selling solar collectors because uh, solar energy was becoming very popular. It started to popular. And uh, the scientists were, uh, I mean, the, the manufacturers were uh, not looking for maximum efficiency, especially if the cost was a great deal. They were looking for a reasonably efficient collector that could be mass produced, that could be manufactured at a fairly um, uh, low cost. And uh, they were also assuming that uh, uh, something like 3 by 6 or 4 feet by 8 feet was a very good size because uh, you could put it in a, you could put a, a couple of dozen of them in uh, boxes and put them on trucks and trace them all over, uh, uh, them all over the country. We saw like a flying um, And these people were, were looking more for manufacturing process, how to make an efficient collector with a simple and expensive process uh, that can be sold fairly inexpensively and in the cost of being made. Um, neither of these approaches really produced the greatest collector. And um, I discovered uh, that that an air collector had some very different properties, mostly because of what was perceived as disadvantages. For example, in a water collector, because it's so efficient, because the water can take the heat out of the collector so well, that a the typical temperature rise in a collector from where the water goes into it to where the water comes out of it was about 10 degrees, 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So that if the water went in at 90 degrees, it would come out at 100 degrees. If it went in at 115 uh, degrees, it would come out at about 125 degrees. Uh, that was the greatest temperature difference in the whole system. So in order to get the temperature of the collector and very large storage tank up from, let's say, room temperature, 70 degrees, to something really usable, which might be 100 degrees, uh, the collector would have to cycle the same water over and over again for hours and hours. Uh, this was perceived as an advantage, but in fact, there was a problem because if you design a collector 
be efficient at 70 degrees, then it won't be very efficient at 120 degrees. Vice versa, high temperature collector isn't particularly efficient at low temperature. So, in fact, uh, collector design has to be a compromise. Uh, like such a collect. 
Uh, below the collection is an animal that is used, a large duck tank, and it hooks them all up and closes uh, uh, it's also a uh, also a rain gutter. When we were building the house, there wasn't really such a thing as a well insulated window. And one of the things that uh, uh, that you can try to do in any energy conserving design, any solar design, is to keep, uh, to make a very tight envelope. To uh, paraphrase that press, and the BPU saved is better than a BPU earned. You don't lose it, you don't have to replace it, whether it's by solar energy or, or any other form. So, what must fill a very tight envelope, and uh, when you, you quickly read the point of diminishing returns because it's
north and the west, the main door. And uh, stairs go downstairs. Uh, here on the right is a close up of uh, these insulated windows. Thank you. 
the normal side of the cube were facing uh, northeast and northwest. In fact, uh, one, the tallest corner of the cube was facing to the north. So I had two completely different, or two related but different uh, geometrical conditions. Uh, one is the normal geometry of the cube, the right angle geometry uh, that, that generated from its corners. And the other, the 45 degree geometry that generated from its diagonal, both diagonal and plan, and the major diagonal in section. And so that, uh, in, the, in the design and the planning of the spaces, I found that uh, when spaces or when, uh, when, when elements in the design were near this south uh, surface, you see the south surface on the right hand side here, uh, and to the left on the left hand. Uh, when, when things were near them, they tended to go to that, uh, they tended to be, to work off of the, uh, the 45 degree geometry. When things gravitated to the north corner, they tended to work off of the 90, 90 degree geometry. And uh, this worked very nicely until those two geometries clash uh, back into one another uh, near the center. Now that's a problem, but uh, what was that? but modern architecture, at least early modern architecture, always delighted in problems. Uh, my my reading of the modern masters is their greatness came from their delight in transcending problems, rather than what we try to do today, which is to avoid them completely and go about our merry way doing what we really like to do. Uh, but the, the masters. Uh, would look at a problem, and uh, in fact, they understood the world to be made of problems, and they delighted in, in attacking them. And uh, if you look at the early work of Wright, the innovation in that building, the transcending of the terribly limited budget, the base material, the support of the device. This is uh, the level above the kitchen, the studio space. In fact, uh, uh, half of the house, half of the volume of the house goes to the studio. Uh, and the sculptor architects. And, uh, so even in, in uh, the program, the house is not very conventional. Uh, and here you see uh, to the north corner, uh, the side on the left north would be the lower uh, right hand corner. Uh, we're, we're working off of the right angle geometry, and then we get to the south, uh, we're working off of the uh, 45 degree geometry. Uh, this produced not so much uh, clever designs, but uh, like conditions that could be worked with. Uh, the stair is where it all comes together. Uh, and the stair is the marriage of these two geometries. Uh, both plan and especially spacious. And uh, the stair is the great spatial multiplier. It has to be there in any case. Uh, but uh, all of the major spaces in the house partake of the space of the stair. So that while there are very low spaces, uh, the, the overriding feeling in the house is that there's always more space above you and below you and around the corner. So that, again, space is multiplied, and even though it's really trying to start with, it seems a great deal bigger than it is. This is one of the, the lowest levels, the living room. Uh, below this floor is a three-stage rock bit. I won't go into that right now, but uh, <laughs> there's a great important advantage to be able to store heat in three separate bins at, uh, at, at three different temperatures. We can collect much earlier. 
earlier in the morning, much later at night, and in fact on cloudy days and other systems would be another active system. Uh, the only large window on the house is the greenhouse. The greenhouse then becomes a buffer uh, uh, And you can see on the right hand side some of our tomatoes growing there. Probably used tomatoes already. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's more than a convenience to be able to eat fresh tomatoes out here on the window. <laughs> growing every month of the year. It makes you feel that somehow you're participating in, uh, in a system that could be a model for something much bigger. Now this probably is a little confusing. This is at the lowest level looking up at the stairs. Uh, the stairs are actually very regular and they're actually a very simple system uh, made of uh, repetition elements. The only thing that varies in them is uh, is the support in the white box. There's a light on. See the number of levels that are light on the right. Light on the left. Also, the process of social privacy. Even called light in the light out. The fireplace is another point in which the two geometries come together. You see the face of the fireplace is uh, due south, uh, yet the requirements build up to a smaller flue, and in this case a smaller shape, a hollow column that has ducts, uh, plumbing, and other things going through it, uh, change the geometry from the south of the 45 geometry on uh, north, east, north, This is the stair from the from the entrance shots uh, kitchen level down to that uh, that living room. Uh, this stair goes down five feet, but all of those other runs, uh, five rises, uh, are what amounts to a quarter of a level. And uh, each each run goes up then a quarter of a level. So there's uh, uh, a whole floor on the north side is four quarters, whereas a whole floor uh, on the east and west is three quarters. Slices down into the floor. Uh, 
Um, that's a problem. Um, but there's some nice solutions to it because it automatically gives you a place where you can build in all sorts of things. Uh, houses are always short on storage. So houses have lots of storage. So, and it's storage that comes in your way to make so important. And it's places that would be unusable for, for other species. <laughs> Uh, on the right is, uh, is one of the two bathrooms. Uh, the, uh, the bathrooms have composting toilets in them, sort of uh, in-house, outhouse. Uh, except there aren't any smells from it. Uh, it's all uh, aerobic digestion. The only product from it is uh, compost. Garden. Uh, we didn't particularly have a problem on sewage disposal, but uh, in terms of this country's infrastructure, probably more is spent on uh, sewage disposal systems than is spent on highways or just about any other single thing. Uh, uh, we get rid right of this material at great cost and great difficulty when, in fact, uh, uh, it should be an important resource for us. Uh, this is a very small scale resource. That's why we don't generate that much. Uh, but it's a good way to finish it. There are better ways to go. Uh, ways of relaxing the trees. They're all backwards. Here are some drawings which
uh, will be able to build the community and provide all services. Uh, this is a very integrated, very synergistic, and very uh, self-sufficient sort of model. I think we're going to see a lot of communities like this uh, happening all over. It seems to be a grassroots sort of model. The architecture has to pay money to do uh, It's not high architecture yet. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not involved with the kinds of issues that the most intellectual among us like to uh, uh, interest them. <coughs> yet it's very much associated with the resources that architecture has always depended on, by open going from. And uh, it's bound to come here. I think the question is, how much will architecture uh, be involved in? Uh, I think it would be much better for the movement and much better for architecture if the two of them can develop side by side and, uh, and, and together. Uh, my, my optimistic outlook is that this will happen. The, the thing that will make a difference uh, is that if all of this should come to pass, it will be the kind of change in architecture that hasn't happened since the beginning of the modern movement. That is, uh, one can look at the uh, at architectural history since the beginning of the modern movement as being a relatively continuous history, uh, an uninterrupted history. Uh, unfortunately, or not, uh, we seem to be right now in the, in the period that the, many people have proclaimed as the end of modern architecture, or the death of modern architecture, or the final burnout, the last death rattles of it, um, which uh, may be just as well, I suppose. Uh, but what, what comes out of its ashes? Uh, I don't think, I don't think looking at the past uh, is, uh, is a resource to create the future. Uh, in the case of modern architecture, I think that my experimental and integrative uh, commitment to dealing with design uh, is, uh, is what will, in the final analysis, count for, for our own survival. Uh, thank you very much.
even though the cost of photovoltaics is very high, uh, uh, the, the cost of building new capacity is about the same order of magnitude as the cost of building a new house. Now, not many people realize that, uh, but in one way or another, we're all paying for that. Uh, and if we, could, if we could make that conversion, of course, in many places, there are many applications in the country for photovoltaics even today, even on a first cost basis or economically. Uh, their cost uh, is coming way down. I think the Reagan administration has cut the rate at which our uh, American producers will bring their cost down, but the Japanese will bring down very fast. We'll be buying them for Sony and Mitsubishi and all of those people. That's right. Yes. Empty buildings? In what sense? Is it something that would I'm still on it. Which word? We're down. It's one of those questions. I see what you're saying. So, uh, and the question is, what about empty buildings in small American towns? Uh, the the, the, the thought behind that apparently was that it seems that utopias always have to take place someplace somewhere else. Why can't they take place where they're already constructed? Uh, that may well happen. Well, my feeling, though, is that. Uh, well, the house I showed you, uh, that's what I don't may seem that I'm bragging about it, but in a way, uh, it's a physical disaster in terms of energy. Yeah, it's, uh, it's 15 miles out in the country from where I work. work. Sorry, I did it. Uh, so that until a few years ago, when I bought a car that got very good gas mileage, uh, uh, all of the energy that I was saving by not having any heating bill, uh, I was spending by, uh, by earning my income, by traveling to work. So that uh, a lot of these first models that we're seeing are ultimately not models at all. They're partial models. They're demonstrating one good thing, but are missing the boat someplace else. And my perception of being involved in this field is that, uh, is that there are all kinds of models, not just in energy, uh, science is changing, uh, the forefront of science is changing dramatically. And I find it very strange that um, an architecture is, in recent years, has declared itself a specialty. Uh, architecture always used to be the most, by far the most integrated of disciplines. Uh, we would accept much more than we could ever handle uh, in terms of our moral responsibility. Uh, and while all of these other disciplines, all of these other professions were highly specialized, and, uh, and now some of these other professions, uh, even such, uh, such old uh, uh, monoliths as the medical profession are opening up or becoming more holistic in their approach, where architecture is turning just the other way. It's declaring itself a specialty. We are uh, aesthetic specialists, aesthetic technicians now. Uh, we give all of the all of the performance aspects to our engineers, our economists, uh, uh, our analysts. Let them handle that. Uh, but we're responsible for the, the formal issues of what the building should look like. Uh, but I, I see I see all throughout our society our uh, uh, in every segment there are movements in this integrative in this holistic. Uh, in this sustainable direction. Mostly the people who are doing it, I find, know nothing about what's happening in other spheres. Uh, the architects don't know what's happening in the health sphere. Uh, the people in the health sphere don't know what's happening uh, in physics or biology. Uh, and they don't know what's happening in terms of uh, human potential movement. But, but, but it's in the air. It's, it's, it's a part of the, the zeitgeist, the time sphere. Uh, but my feeling is that uh, you need? the first few models probably need to happen in some degree of isolation, uh, where they're not influenced. Uh, they won't happen in New York City, for example. Uh, and they may 
not happen in, in any large city. They need to happen out in the country where there are few other influences. They need to happen among people who choose to live in a particular way that we might not choose to live. And, but once they prove the point, it's like uh, we're, we're, we're blessed with the uh, uh, we're blessed with living on this magnificent dung heap. Uh, we're mushrooms, uh, I'd rather say. We're, we're, we're mushroom spores and we're living on this magnificent dung heap. And we couldn't be happier because this dung heap is providing us with all of the nutrients we live. And for many generations we flourish. We produce these bountiful crops of mushrooms. Uh, but since we're mushrooms, since we're parasites, uh, we don't create any of our own food. And little by little, over the generations, we deplete this dung heap of its nutrients. And so our my mycelium has to go deeper and deeper into this pile in order for us to grow. And more of our energy goes to getting our food. And we're smaller and smaller. And pretty soon we're about to uh, extinguish ourselves simply because we've run out and we have none of the sources. But, uh, but one night spring, a seed falls on this dung heap. It's a seed of a plant which can make its own food. And the plant flourishes. And uh, uh, not only does it flourish, but it returns, it returns uh, food back to the dung heap. In fact, some of the mushrooms start growing again underneath, in the shade of these, uh, these plants. So we're in the envious position of being uh, the last generations of mushrooms and the first generations of plants. We've got to make a transition. We have the wherewithal to do it, but we have to know that we, work, we, we need to do it. Uh, mushrooms have sustained themselves on the stored food. Uh, we've got to, we have the means to live off current income from the sun. And uh, we're the people that are going to do it anyway. Any other I think Bill Feeney announced that we get together somewhere afterwards. Where did he say? I was out of the room when he said that. Okay, we'll tell you out there where we're going to go. But uh, anybody that'd be interested in talking with Dick further, we're going to reside someplace where we can sit down and have a drink or something. So thank you very much.